Andrew, thank you for joining us today. Uh, first of all, I'm intrigued. How on earth did you get Bob Geldof to write a glowing review of your book? It's on the back cover. I can't imagine he reads many political memoirs. Tell me how you pulled that one off. Well, thank you, Isabel, and uh, thank you for your kind comments about my book. It's not, it's not a you know, politician's view of how you get to utopia or self-justificatory. I'm writing it mainly to entertain, although I try and say some serious things about some aspects of policy, which for me, or, or I think for my constituents, are particularly uh, interesting. But it, but it is really designed to amuse and I hope to, to entertain. Um, I managed to persuade a number of uh, people to, to give me something for the back of the book, uh, quite a broad cross-section, from Michael Gove to Jess Phillips, to Penelope Lively, to Alistair Campbell, to Giles Brandreth, and also to Bob Geldof, whom I've known for some years. We really sort of got to know each other over international development. And he's a, a very good friend of mine. In fact, uh, just a week ago, he turned 70 and I went to his party in, 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 in Dublin, which was a, a great, great occasion. And he's someone I tremendously admire. He's been very helpful to Britain, actually, at the United Nations, and I tell a story about that in the book. Um, but uh, he's he's a sort of he's a national treasure in Britain, and he's a proud son of Ireland, where they love him very very deeply. And he's a wonderful person who who literally tilted the world on its axis over the but dreadful. Well done you, well done you for getting him uh, to give an endorsement to your book, and also to Alistair Campbell and Jess Phillips, both Labour figures. They don't always rush to praise Tory MPs. Now, you had two big jobs in government uh, in recent years, one as International Development Secretary and the other as Chief Whip. Um, now, most normal people don't really know uh, what that job involves. Um, can you tell us a bit about it and the types of tricks and dark arts that the whips use to keep their MPs in line? Well, the whips office is one of those examples, really, of the establishment that have changed in recent years. And um, uh, I spent quite a long time in the whips office in the 1990s when the Conservative Party was riven just for a change by debates about uh, Europe. And many of the stories I tell are from that uh, era. And I can tell stories because chief whips don't write uh, books about the chief whip's position. But I can tell the stories from, you know, more than 25 years ago, because the nature of whipping has changed so much. And if you ask me the one single thing that has changed it, it is social media, actually. It is because, you know, the, the arts of the whips, if deployed uh, against their fellow members of parliament, now would go straight onto social media in a way that they would never have done back in the 90s. So it's the web, website on you. Become, Is it... I think, more of a welfare, um, a welfare unit, you know, uh, uh, within within Parliament, really. Are you worried about so these days you can't quite get away with some of the tricks you used to use, I suppose, because you're worried that you'd be exposed. Is that right? Well, I, th I think the whole nature of Parliament has changed. You know, I described what it was like in 1987 when uh, I was uh, first elected, when Parliament was very much, much like a cross between a well-funded London gentleman's club and a public school. And I got a picture in my office of taken from the press gallery in the House of Commons, looking down across it. And almost everyone in the House of Commons is a grey-haired, dark-suited, waistcoat-wearing man on both sides of the House. And you know, in the, all, in the 30 odd years since then, 35 years since then, it's changed out of all recognition. It's much more like the society yeah. that we seek to serve now. And, and that's a good thing, of course. Now, um, tell us about your role in making Boris Johnson an MP, because in the book you give a very, very detailed account of this. And, I mean, in fact, you were basically ready to resign uh, over getting him on board because he was very controversial when he applied first many years ago to become a candidate for the Tory party. And a lot of people did not want him on board at all. Uh, and you really stuck your neck out for Boris Johnson, didn't you? In fact, I think you threatened to resign from your position uh, as somebody who had some responsibility for the selection of candidates if he wasn't let through. Is that right? Well, it, it is right. And I had the job in those days of being the vice chairman of the party responsible for candidates, for selecting candidates. And 
Um, I led a team that would interview and uh, you'd go away for 24 hours to a hotel normally near Heathrow Airport, where 48 potential candidates would come for the selection uh, process. And I didn't really realize that Boris was so controversial, but part of the job of the team was uh, included members of the European Parliament who knew him very well from his time as a journalist in, in Brussels. And there was, there was quite a brouhaha, which went up as far as the then Prime Minister, John uh, Major. And um, I mean, I think if, 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 if the decision of the team that I had led uh, had been to turn him down, um, then I don't think I would have been able to continue in that job because you can't, you can't have the party's processes and structures pushed aside in a in a um, Did um, you? We're, in we're an slightly unorthodox t- way. tight on time, and I want to get through so many other aspects of your book. But I, so you, you evidently you really fought for Boris to become an MP. Um, you could have stopped his uh, his rise before it even began. Um, now he's prime minister, and you followed his career all the way through, uh, and you're, you're not in Cabinet. I don't know whether you expected him uh, to put you there. I know you supported him for, for the leadership in the most recent contest. Have you ever had any cause for regret that you didn't actually head his career off at the pass all those years ago? No, because although he's controversial, he is absolutely brilliant, and he is authentically a Conservative. And the job of the, uh, the party's selection processes is to present to constituency associations electable people. And, you know, whatever you think of Boris Johnson, he is a brilliant and charismatic politician. And clearly he does have a very so unique he right, style, right doesn't, on the list. doesn't he? He has a very unique style. I think you've sort of thought of him as rather, rather like a, a sort of um, a royal in a way, a historic royal. Yes, he is. He, I think he is a bit like a monarch, really. I don't think he has an awful lot of time for the normal structures through which prime ministers uh, govern, um, which does remind me slightly of a medieval uh, monarch, perhaps Henry VIII, who after Henry all VIII. conferred on my constituency royal status. And now, one of the aspects uh, of your book that will be of interest to people is the whole Plebgate saga that people may recall. This was the altercation you had with a policeman at the gates of Downing Street, which led to all sorts of legal shenanigans uh, and culminated, sadly, in your resignation. Uh, That was a really hard time for you, wasn't it? Um, I've been thinking that this weekend we've got Mental Health Awareness Day coming up. um, And I know in your book you talk about the really dark times that you went through after you left the cabinet and you had that uh, very, very traumatic experience bringing a libel case that ultimately you lost and that cost you a great deal of money. Talk to us about how it was for you uh, in those uh, difficult times. Well, it, mercifully, it was a long time ago now, but it was a horrendous experience. And not just for me, it was a horrendous experience for everyone who was involved on, on both sides. And it all ended in a mess, as you say, because I was unable to convince the judge uh, of my uh, case. Uh, but also something like 10 police officers got disciplined. Uh, several got sacked. One went to prison. So, so it all ended in a in, in a mess. Um, and um, the the chapter is one of the shortest chapters in the book. I try to not to revisit what happened, but to explain what it is like to be caught up in a media squall if you are in public life. Uh, so that's what I dwell on in the chapter. And as you say, um, you know, I have become much more interested since then in supporting in my constituency, but also more widely uh, on an all-party basis, what we do in Parliament to try and promote uh, better mental health and better treatment of mental health. And um, it's something which we, sh- we do focus much more on now. And of course, it's been largely destigmatized, and, and that's a good thing. We are making progress, and we need to make much more progress on that. Thank you.